Hello everybody, welcome back to my channel and thank you for joining me for another true crime deep dive video. This case is going to be in two parts, so today is the first part and then next time I won't make you wait too long like usual, but next time it's the second part and I just thought that that this case with all the context, with all the details, I mean I didn't know it was going to be as in-depth when I when I started researching it. I thought it was going to be a one-time coffee and crime time, um, and then I got into it, and I realized it needs to be in two parts. And the case we are talking about today, it not only has a book written about it called Perfect Victim, and this book was actually written by the mother of our victim, but there was also a 2009 movie made based on that book called In Her Skin, and it's an Australian movie. Sam Neill is in it. He's one of my favorite actors. He was in Jurassic Park and Peaky Blinders and Merlin, a um, really, really good actor, old school. But you can watch the movie on Amazon Prime if you have it. There's a lot to unpack with this case, a lot of shocking and unbelievable things that happened. And there are tons of factors and tons of shades of gray that make this case a tough one to take a firm stance on. And as a heads up, I think you're going to be very, very upset with the way that law enforcement initially handled this case. I really do like to be fair to law enforcement. If they do a good job, I like to shout them out, give them their flowers, but I also have no problem shining a light on their failures because I believe when law enforcement fails, they fail really hard. And there's much more, you know, deep and, and long standing implications. But before we dive in into all of that, <laughs> let's have a word from the sponsor of today's video, GlassesUSA.com. By cutting out the middleman, GlassesUSA.com offers prescription glasses and sunglasses at up to 70% off of retail prices. I obviously wear glasses. Every time you see me, I have glasses on because I am blind, and wearing glasses is just a part of my reality, which is fine, as long as I can make that reality a reality that I like. Part of making it a reality that I like is by having a lot of different pairs of glasses that I can choose from, switch up, uh, really show my personality, you know, kind of coordinate with my outfits or whatever kind of look I'm going for that day. And with GlassesUSA.com, I can do that because I don't have to spend a ton of money on every pair of glasses. I can shop online for all of my eyewear needs at affordable prices without leaving the comfort of my own home. GlassesUSA.com offers over 9,000 styles of eyeglasses and sunglasses, including in-house brands like Muse and Amelia E., these glasses that I'm wearing right now are so cute. I love them with this outfit, actually. But these are the Amelia E. Alara in clear and blue. I think they're so cute, especially with the shirt I'm wearing today. That's what I'm talking about, matching and coordinating your glasses to your outfits or to your look so that you kind of, you know, have your glasses become a part of who you are, a part of your personality. But GlassesUSA.com also has a ton of designer brands like Ray-Ban, Oakley, Armani, Gucci, and many more. So so these glasses I'm wearing right now, they're the Coach HC6078. I love these glasses. You probably see me wearing them all the time. So far at this point, they are my favorite, but that could change at any time. But check this out, right? This is so cool. So I actually received this in the mail from GlassesUSA.com, and it said, it's time capsule. Don't open till 2022. And I was like, oh, I cannot open them until 2022, but I couldn't wait. And I did open them. Ray-Ban is reviving one of their most iconic styles, the Clubmaster. And GlassesUSA.com is offering the Clubmaster in an exclusive new color, transparent gray with silver metal, and it comes packaged in this really cool 80s time capsule. So like there's ticket stubs and there's um, lens wipes, you know, for your glasses, but it looks like a cassette tape. And they included Polaroid pictures of the glasses, just so cool. And I think that the glasses themselves are pretty snazzy. I love these. I love these glasses. Let me know what you guys think in the comment section. But for the rest of the video, I will be wearing these blue babies. Because that's the great thing about GlassesUSA.com, right? You can find all your favorite glasses, but you can also find every conceivable style and color of glasses. And you can shop for specialty glasses like sports or safety glasses, glasses for your kids. My little one, Bella, she's four. She just started wearing glasses. And her glasses are all from GlassesUSA.com. And almost all pairs of glasses on GlassesUSA.com or all pairs of frames can be ordered with your prescription and blue light blocking coating. 
There are two tools that are going to help make your shopping experience easier and more seamless. Firstly, GlassesUSA.com's virtual try-on tool. This will show you exactly how you're going to look in whichever pair of glasses you're interested in. I use it every time I'm choosing a new pair of glasses because it does help me gauge how big they're going to be on my face, like how they're going to look with my face shape. GlassesUSA.com also has a prescription scanner app, so if you don't have your current prescription available and you want to order new glasses, you can use this app to scan your current pair of glasses to help figure out your prescription. It's easy, it's free, and it takes under 10 minutes. And when you're done, you can start shopping immediately for your new pair of glasses. A complete pair of eyeglasses and sunglasses starts at only $30. And basic prescription lenses are included with every frame, including premium brands. And GlassesUSA.com offers you peace of mind when shopping online with them. So if you do not absolutely love your new glasses, within 14 days of delivery, GlassesUSA.com will give you a 100% money-back guarantee, no questions asked. So the next thing that I have to tell you is basically go in the description box, click on the link, and start shopping for your new glasses today. I love GlassesUSA.com. I will not get my glasses from anywhere else. No one in my family will get their glasses from any place else, and I know you will love them too. So hit the link in the description box. Check them out for yourselves. Thank you so much to GlassesUSA for sponsoring this video, and let's dive in. Rachel Barber was born on September 12, 1983 in Glen Alvey, located on the Bass Coast, which is about 80 miles southeast of Melbourne, Australia. Rachel would have grown up in a really beautiful place with a lot of nice scenery and wide open spaces to run and play in, which is exactly what she did when she was a kid. But in late 1992 or early 1993, Rachel and her family moved to Mont Albert, a suburb of Melbourne, so that Rachel could pursue her dream of dancing. Rachel had shown an amazing gift for dance and music from a very early age. In fact, her entire family seemed to have a streak of creativity and a talent in the arts. Her grandfather, Ivan Southall, is a well-known author of young adult fiction, as well as some history, biography, and nonfiction works. His daughter and Rachel's mother, Elizabeth, also became a writer of children's books, and her husband and Rachel's father, Michael Barber, was a toy maker and a designer. Both of Rachel's sisters played instruments. Her sister, Ashley Rose, played the flute, and her other sister, Heather, played the violin. And overall, the entire family was described as incredibly loving to each other and warm and welcoming to others. When Elizabeth had been pregnant with Rachel, she played classical music for her daughter in the womb, and she said that she swore she could feel Rachel reacting to the music, moving and twisting along with the sweeping notes of the instruments. Now, Rachel fell in love with classical ballet as a young child, and she adored performing. She even would produce and direct little plays and musicals for her and her sisters to perform for their parents when they were little. And Rachel dreamed of one day being a professional dancer. She wanted to dance on Broadway. And when she retired from dancing, she wanted to open her own dance studio and name it Rachel Starr's Dance Studio because that was her stage name. Rachel was enrolled in classes at the Melbourne Dance Academy, and she went on to reach many achievements and milestones in her short career. She even performed on stage at Melbourne's Princess Theatre and worked as a backup dancer for the Australian rock star Jimmy Barnes. At home, Rachel's closets were packed with dance clothes, you know, leotards and leg warmers and things like that. And she convinced her parents to let her pull the rug up in her bedroom so that she could practice on the bare hardwood floors. And I don't mean just like roll in an area rug back. Like these were installed carpets. And, you know, Rachel said, I want a hardwood floor to practice my dance on. And her parents said, have at it. And she pulled up all her carpeting. Rachel was very popular in school because she was usually upbeat and easy to be around, and she had a large circle of friends, but academically, she really struggled, and she was sort of unable to get good grades, no matter how hard she tried. One night, she had cried to her mother that her failures in school were not due to an unwillingness to try. She just didn't understand it. She didn't feel like she could get it. And all she wanted to really do was dance. Her mind was very focused on that. Her teachers would report that during school breaks, while the other kids talked or hung out or went outside, Rachel took to the school hallways to practice her routines. 
So Elizabeth and Mike Barber were not really surprised when, just after her 15th birthday, Rachel asked for permission to leave school and focus on dancing full time. She wanted to become a student at the dance factory in Richmond. Her father, Mike, gave his full support, but her mother, Elizabeth, was a little bit more wary, and she told Rachel that they could give it a shot, but the next term for dance school wouldn't be starting for months, so Elizabeth told Rachel she needed to go out and find a job or something productive to do so that she wasn't just sitting at home waiting for classes to start. For the next two weeks, Rachel went out and applied for jobs, but all she wanted to do was dance. So at the end of that two weeks, she paid a visit to the dance factory and spoke to their creative director about extending her scholarship so that she could start classes immediately. And, you know, apparently Rachel was very persuasive. She said, you know, my mother wants me to do something productive and I can think of nothing more productive than dancing. And the creative director was really impressed with her initiative, so she agreed. Now, at the dance factory, Rachel thrived, and she developed a tight-knit ring of close friends who shared her passion, including a boy named Emmanuel Carella, or, as everyone called him, Manny. Rachel's parents once said that if Rachel had to start dating at 15, she could not have made a better choice than Manny. Rachel and Manny were head over heels for each other, and they were basically inseparable from the moment they met in May of 1998. And they made sure that they would speak to each other on the phone every single night before bed. Rachel had also dabbled in modeling for a time. Her grandfather's wife, a woman named Susan, was a contemporary artist who would take photographs and arrange them into collages. And Susan loved photographing Rachel for these collages and these pieces because Rachel was such a natural beauty. She was the epitome of that fresh-faced vision of youth that we see lining the glossy pages of magazines around the world. Rachel was tall and slim. She had a flawless complexion, skin the color of porcelain, silky, long, dark hair, and lurid green eyes that were the centerpiece of her perfectly symmetrical face. To put it simply, Rachel Barber was a girl that I would have hated in high school, not because she was nasty or mean, but because she seemed to exist so effortlessly. When life felt so hard for me all the time, you know, I do remember that there was girls in school who I thought, you know, they just seem to have it so easy. Everyone likes them. They always have a boyfriend. Whenever there's like those little things during school where, you know, boys or girls send each other flowers and then they get delivered during class, they have all these carnations on their desk. You know, they're always getting invited to dances. Everything seems so easy and effortless for them. And this is important to our story. The last weekend of February 1999 proved to be a very busy one for Rachel. Her boyfriend Manny had to work all weekend, so she kept herself occupied by making a present for him that she wanted to surprise him with on Monday. It was a giant purple velour cushion in the shape of a heart that she planned to give him, and when she gave it to him, she was going to tell him that no matter where he was or what he was doing, he should always keep her heart safe. On Sunday morning, February 28th, Rachel and her mother Elizabeth had breakfast together, and then they went shopping for new dance pants for Rachel. Now, money was always tight with the Barber family. They were usually living paycheck to paycheck, and anything extra would often be used for items that Rachel needed for dance. And if you were ever in dance classes and you did it seriously or you have a child who is, you know Ooh, it adds up. It starts adding up. All the stuff that you need, all the stuff you have to buy, and they grow, and then you need new ballet shoes or new tap shoes or new jazz shoes or new tights, new stockings, new leggings. It's just never-ending. After shopping, Rachel and Elizabeth stopped in at the Bayswater family pet daycare. So apparently Rachel for some time had been begging her parents to adopt a new kitten since their family cat had died. And her mother had said no, no, no. But finally on this day, she said yes. So they went to check out their options. Rachel was so excited. and She told her mother she was going to name their new kitten Humphrey. Later that evening around 5 p.m., 
Elizabeth saw Rachel talking and laughing on the phone with someone who she assumed was Rachel's boyfriend, Manny, since the young couple spoke on the phone every night before bed. Before going to sleep, Rachel and her family all sat down together to watch Vanity Fair on television. It's a BBC series, for those of you who are wondering. And then everyone went to bed because Mike had to work the next morning and the girls had school. Now, on the morning of Monday, March 1st, 1999, Rachel got up and dressed for school in black dance pants, a black bra, and a long-sleeved gray and blue thermal shirt. She slipped her feet into her black block dance shoes and swung her black dance bag over her shoulder. As a finishing touch, Rachel fastened on a gold necklace with a diamond-like stone on it, matching earrings, and a blue topaz ring, and she slid the purple cushion she had made for Manny into her bag. Now, Rachel would have to take a tram into Richmond, where the dance studio was located. And once again, for those of you who aren't familiar with some of these terms, a tram is like a trolley. So the closest thing I can think of, for those of us who are in the States, to make a comparison to is San Francisco. Like, you have to ride the trolley if you want to get anywhere around that city because when you're walking in San Francisco, you're either walking uphill or downhill. There's no in between and it's all hard on the legs. All right. But good, good for the butt. Anyways, Rachel would take one of two tramps to school every morning and either her mother or her father would drop her at one of the tram stations on their way to work in the morning. Now, Rachel did not want to miss her tram on this specific morning because she had plans to have breakfast with her friend Kylie at Kylie's house before they walked to school together. So she was pestering her father to hurry, and then she yelled out, I love you, and goodbye to her mother before running out to Mike's car, and the two of them pulled away. Now, at that time, Elizabeth didn't know that this was the last moment she would see her gifted and treasured daughter. Mike Barber drove his daughter Rachel to the tram stop located at the corner of Riversdale and Elgar Roads at around 9.30 a.m. And before he left, he told her that he would be back at the same stop to pick her up at 6.15 that evening. Rachel told him she would be there, and she made no mention of having plans that evening. She didn't make any mention of having something to do after school. She didn't make any mention of being late. She didn't tell her father she wouldn't be there at 6.15 when he arrived at the tram station to pick her up. Now, once in Richmond, Rachel headed to her friend's house for breakfast, and it wasn't just her friend Kylie present, but Rachel's boyfriend Manny and Manny's brother Dominic, who were both students at the dance factory with Rachel and Kylie. Rachel gave Manny his present, his little heart cushion. They had breakfast all together, and around 10.15 a.m., the group of youngsters headed out to go to school. Now, throughout the day, Rachel behaved normally. She wasn't acting strange, but she did make mention to a friend at school that she had big plans that night. When the friend asked what the plans were, Rachel responded that the plans were with a friend of hers, and she couldn't give specifics, but she was going to make a lot of money, and she'd explain everything to him the next day. At 5.30 p.m., classes were let out for the day, and Rachel left the dance factory with some of her classmates, including her boyfriend, Manny. While they walked, Rachel pulled Manny into a shoe store and showed him a pair of chunky blue Spice Girl platform sneakers that she had been wanting for weeks. Manny watched as Rachel asked the salesperson to put the shoes aside for her because she was planning to come back the next day to finally purchase them. And Manny was surprised because the shoes were $100, and he knew that Rachel did not have money like that. Her parents were good about providing her what she needed for a dance, but they had been clear that if she wanted things for herself, extra things, she would have to work and find a way to pay for them herself. Now, when Manny asked her where this money was coming from, Rachel told him that she was working a job that night where she would get free clothing and make a load of money. Once again, Manny pressed her for more details, but Rachel said she couldn't tell him anything besides that she had been presented this opportunity from an old female friend, and she'd been instructed not to tell anyone about it, not her parents or even her boyfriend, but she promised him she was making the money in a legitimate way and she wasn't doing anything immoral. Manny was still unsettled, though, because Rachel was usually very upfront and transparent, and it wasn't really like her to be so secretive. After leaving the store, Rachel kissed Manny goodbye and promised to call him that night, as she always did, and then they went their separate ways. 
Rachel continued walking on with another classmate. This classmate's name was Tamara Gunn. And Tamara was surprised when Rachel did not walk towards her usual tram stop. Tamara asked Rachel where she was going, and Rachel responded that her father was picking her up that day at the end of the tram line. Tamara offered to walk with Rachel the rest of the way, but Rachel thanked her and told her she could get there by herself. Rachel Barber was last seen by her friends walking on the west side of Church Street headed towards Bridge Road, and then she vanished. Back at the Barber home, Elizabeth was preparing dinner for her family, but she kept checking the clock. She had been expecting to see her husband Mike and her daughter Rachel walk through the door any minute like they did every evening around 6.30 p.m., but 7 o'clock had come and gone. There was no sign of them. In her book, Perfect Victim, Elizabeth said, quote, I have a vivid imagination, and this night I had Mike rammed between two other cars, or with a flat tire, or yes, that's it, without petrol. We were always running on empty. They probably didn't have the cost of a phone call between them, and unlike many families, we didn't use mobile phones, end quote. So what Elizabeth is saying is she let her imagination kind of get worked up and get away from her, and she was worried, like, did Mike get into a car accident or get a flat tire? Maybe he ran out of gas, but, you know, she also knew that her husband and her daughter didn't have cell phones, and they probably didn't have a ton of money on them to, you know, go and, and make the use of a payphone. So she's worried that something bad happened and they can't get a hold of her. And Elizabeth had worked herself into a tangled ball of nerves when the phone rang around 7.40 p.m., jarring her from her frenzied thoughts. When she answered the phone, at first Elizabeth was comforted to hear the voice of her husband, Mike, but then she was worried because Mike sounded worried, very worried. Mike told Elizabeth that he'd arrived at the tram station a little after 6 p.m. as usual, and he'd waited for their daughter, Rachel, but the tram had come and gone, and she had not gotten off of it. Mike decided to wait for Rachel some more, thinking maybe she missed her usual tram and she'd be on the next one, but she wasn't on that one either. And after an hour of waiting, Mike had driven to his parents' house in Blackburn to call Elizabeth and see what he should do next. Elizabeth suggested that he go to the other tram station that they would sometimes bring Rachel to. This tram station was at Camberwell. So I believe twice a week, Rachel would leave from that station because her mother would drive her on her way to work. While Mike Barber drove to the Camberwell tram station to check on Rachel, Elizabeth hung up and called the Box Hill Police Station to report her missing. So she ended up calling the Box Hill Police Station because it happened to be the one that was closest to the tram station that Rachel didn't end up at in the evening. The police asked Elizabeth how old Rachel was, and Elizabeth said, you know, Rachel is 15. And they asked Elizabeth how long had Rachel been gone, and You know, Elizabeth said just a couple of hours we dropped her off the tram station. She didn't come home on her usual tram, so we don't really know how long she's been gone. And she's kind of panicking. Obviously, this is her daughter, and the police are asking all these questions, questions she doesn't have the answers to. And then the police told Elizabeth to relax. They said, hey, if you guys go to the Camberwell tram station and you don't find her there, you know, you can come into the station and fill out an official police report. But just relax. Probably just a miscommunication. Calm down. You'll find her. She'll turn up. Elizabeth hung up with the police and then called Rachel's boyfriend, Manny, who told her about the stop at the shoe store. And Elizabeth also called Rachel's friend, Kylie, who told Elizabeth that Rachel had seemed fine and had told Kylie she would see her the next day for breakfast as usual. Elizabeth began to panic because Rachel was afraid of the dark, and she did not like walking by herself after night fell. And this fear had stemmed from an incident when she'd been walking home by herself a few months earlier, and she'd been followed by two men. That This had scared her, obviously, which is why she had had her parents drop her off at the tram and pick her up each morning and each night. Elizabeth also knew that Rachel would not knowingly or purposely leave them hanging like this because she would know that they would be worried and she would have found a way to contact them if she'd been held up or if she'd missed the train or if she was hanging out with friends, she would have contacted them and told them so that they wouldn't worry. At 8.45 p.m., Michael Barber went to the Box Hill Police Station to file an official missing persons report on his daughter and he was told by the police 
to not worry so much. Rachel was 15. She was a teenager. She'd probably been hanging out with friends. She lost track of time. You know, never mind that her parents had already called all her friends and her boyfriend. But the police were like, just chill, you know. We'll, we'll, we'll keep an eye out for her. But these things happen. Kids will be kids. So for the rest of the night, Michael and Elizabeth scoured the streets of Richmond, calling Rachel's name, driving aimlessly, hoping to spot some sign of her, but they found nothing. The next morning was Tuesday, March 2nd. Rachel had not returned home that night, the night before, and she did not show up at Kylie's for breakfast, and she did not show up to school for her classes. She never missed classes if she could help it. So after dropping their other two daughters off at school, Michael and Elizabeth Barber went back to the Box Hill Police Station, armed with pictures of Rachel, to help aid in their search. But the Barbers were stunned to find out that no one had been searching for their daughter besides them. The officer on duty at the desk had never even heard the name Rachel Barber before, and he couldn't even find a report detailing her disappearance, and he had to go, and he was, like, shuffling through papers, and he had to go and find another guy, and then that other guy came, and eventually the report was found. But it seemed like there was no urgency to locate this 15-year-old girl who had never not come home before. Elizabeth had Manny take her to the shoe store that Rachel had brought him to the day before to see if Rachel had been back to pay for and collect her new shoes or call and say she was on her way. The salesperson knew who Rachel was. You know, she said Rachel always came in to look at those shoes, and she had asked that the shoes be put on hold for her, but Rachel had not yet returned to pay for them. Elizabeth and Michael began to walk, and they just kind of walked on the street the route that Rachel would have taken from school to the tram station. And on their way, they entered multiple shops, showing pictures of Rachel to the people inside and asking if anyone had seen her. And many of the employees of these shops knew and recognized Rachel, but none of them had seen her since the previous day. Now, one shop manager did tell the Barbers about an article she had read in the paper recently. She had read that this man, who had been put in prison for illegally operating a brothel, had recently been released from prison, and he may have been up to his old tricks. Could it be possible that Rachel had fallen for a line that he or someone who worked for him had given her? Maybe he or one of his employees told Rachel that she could make a lot of money doing something completely benign like modeling, but instead she would end up working in a brothel? So the Barbers obtained a copy of this newspaper, which featured the story, and they took it to the Richmond Police Department. This is a different police department than the Box Hill Station, where they had initially reported Rachel missing. So after hearing the whole story, the officer that they were talking to at the Richmond police station said, listen, I can't do I can't do much of anything at this point because Rachel's disappearance needs to be investigated by the department that it had been reported to, right? So he's saying, you've already reported it to a different police station, and I know you want my help looking for your missing 15-year-old daughter, but my hands are tied because paperwork, because semantics? I don't know. He did seem to feel bad about it, and he gave them the name of the sergeant at the Box Hill station who had filed the report initially, so that would make him the lead on Rachel's case. And the barbers even asked, they were like, hey, can we go and, like, detract that report from the Box Hill police station and then file a new report with you guys so you guys can look into it because this is where she goes to school. This is where it appears, you know, she went missing. At the point when we reported Rachel missing, we did so at the Box Hill police station because we thought that would make the most sense. But now we see it's better if you guys look into it. And the guy at the Richmond station was like, no, it doesn't work like that. And that's that's kind of dumb. It should work like that if it doesn't. Because if you find a new police station that's closer to where your kid went missing, or may have more resources or even just seems to be more engaged and more willing to help you, you should be able to say, hey, we don't want you anymore, Box Hill. We're going with Richmond. But they couldn't do that. So after leaving the Richmond police station, the barbers continued walking the streets. And I mean, they're hearing all, I feel so bad for them, hearing all sorts of horror stories in all of these shops. People would be like, oh, I heard there was really bad, like, gang activity over on this street. Or I heard, you know, that there was some guy snatching up girls for trafficking over on this street. It was just, what a nightmare. I can't even imagine. To have your daughter missing, police aren't really out there actively looking, so you feel that you have to. And as you're doing that, you're hearing all of this stuff that's making you more afraid than you were each minute prior. 
So they go back to walking the streets talking to shop owners and things like that. And in one dress shop, a salesperson told Mike Barber that on Monday, March 1st, this is the same day that Rachel went missing, this woman who worked at the dress shop had been followed home by a female customer. So apparently this female customer was in the shop and sort of like watching the employee and then the employee left and the female customer left too and followed the shopkeeper on foot for a bit before approaching her telling her she was a pretty girl and she could make a lot of money working at the Daily Planet which apparently was or is a legal brothel in Elsternwick. So Elizabeth Barber wondered if maybe her beautiful and striking daughter could have also been approached by someone like this, a recruiter for a brothel. And maybe Rachel would have thought she was being offered a modeling job. So Elizabeth Barber called the brothel and the people over there at the Daily Planet, they were like, listen, everything we do is above board. We do not recruit underage girls. We do not hire underage girls to work in our establishment. And then they gave her the number for the Victorian Prostitutes Collective, which is a group formed by sex workers and run by sex workers to promote health and safety for these women and girls in the streets. So Elizabeth spoke to a woman there who told her that if Rachel had not been located by the end of the week, that Elizabeth should call back with Rachel's description because they had staff who went out into the streets to look out for the sex workers and they would keep an eye out for Rachel. So while the police were not being particularly helpful, the community really did pull together to do all that they could. The owner of a cafe that Rachel and Manny would often drink coffee in gave Elizabeth the number of a friend of his, a detective with a missing persons unit, and this guy's name was Neil Patterson, the detective. Another shop owner scanned a picture of Rachel and made a missing persons poster that could be passed out and posted on telephone poles and windows. Everyone was helping to get Rachel's, you know, disappearance out there. There. Everyone kind of went out and started looking for her. A lot of people went out and they were putting pictures up. A lot of people from Rachel's school were really helping. Manny was a big help. Kylie was a big help. There was a long time, a huge period where the police were not, <laughs> were not helping at all. And a lot of people from the community pitched in. But still another day and night passed with no sign of Rachel. And her parents did not get a wink of sleep that night. Elizabeth laid in bed, eyes wide open, and went over all the possibilities in her mind. But she said that she felt she would know. She would know if her daughter was dead. And she didn't have that feeling. So there was still hope for her. On Wednesday, March 3rd, the Barbers met with Neil Patterson, this detective from the missing persons unit in Richmond. He said once again he could not do anything because Box Hill, the Box Hill station, was responsible for the investigation but he also said that he would call over there and find out what he could and, you know, hopefully get them moving. After walking the streets and calling Rachel's name for most of the morning, Mike and Elizabeth went to Rachel's dance school to see if the police had been there yet. So they had called the Box Hill station earlier that morning, and they had been told that detectives were being sent out to the dance factory to question people and, you know, see what they could find. But apparently... The detectives had not shown up yet, even though it was like mid-afternoon, and Rachel's dance teacher was a little agitated by it. And Rachel's dance teacher had also called the police a bunch of times. Elizabeth called Neil Patterson, the detective from the missing persons unit, and he was sympathetic. You know, he was sympathetic that no one had really done anything yet, but he also said that when he'd called, they'd told him that typically 97% of missing people are going to turn up within 48 hours, and the rest of them are usually found within five days. So that's typically the time, I guess, five days where the police would start taking this seriously, even though she was a 15-year-old girl who had no record of running away, who had no record of wanting to run away. They were still really kind of going with their theory that she had taken off on her own and she would come back when she was ready. Neil Patterson did suggest, however, after hearing Manny's story about Rachel getting a job with an old female friend, that Rachel's parents make a list of Rachel's friends, old and new. And this is so frustrating. Oh, it hurts me to even retell the story. Elizabeth couldn't remember all the names of Rachel's friends because Rachel had switched schools a couple of times. You know, they had moved a couple of times. So she called Rachel's old school to see if they could provide a list of people that Rachel had been known to affiliate with. But the school said they could not do that because of privacy, because they were minors, and Elizabeth should call the police and have the police call the school 
to get these names. So Elizabeth called the Box Hill Police Station. She once again got a police officer on the phone who had no idea who Rachel Barber was, what the case was, what was going on. Elizabeth had to go over the whole story again. So this is like the fifth time she has told this whole story to a law enforcement official by this point. And her daughter's missing in every minute that she spends having to reiterate what she's already said a million times is just going to be frustrating to the absolute max. And she goes through all of this again only to be told by the police, like, we don't know why the school told you that we could do this, but we can't do this. Okay, so the Barbers, they go to the Richmond police station again. This time they're there to present the law enforcement officials at the Richmond police station with missing persons posters, missing persons posters of Rachel so that the police can put them up in the station or hand them out or, you know, just do something, do something with them. And they were sat down in an interview room and a detective basically told them, you guys need to get some rest. You know, you're up all night searching for your daughter. You don't need to be doing that. She's probably fine. She's going to be home. You're killing yourself for no reason. But hey, if you want to really do something, if you want to feel useful, go home, get some rest. But before you do that, check under your house. Because Rachel, you know, she probably ran away. And she may have come home already, but she's scared of getting in trouble. So she may be hiding under your house. So go home and check under your house. (laughs) And the barbers were like, that's ludicrous. Why in the world? Would she, would she be hiding under the house? That like of all the places you could hide, crawling under the house, and and basically Mike and Elizabeth Barbara was like, that's absolutely ludicrous. You guys realize that sounds ludicrous, right? And the police were like, okay, you may think it's ridiculous, and that's fine, but you should still go home and get some rest anyways, because a person who does not want to be found will not be found. So clearly, law enforcement at this point in both stations, Box Hill and Richmond, they're making an assumption that Rachel has gone off on her own and she wants to be missing. She doesn't want her parents to find her. But they never questioned the Barbers about why that might be. Like, were there problems at home? Was Rachel upset with her boyfriend? Was she having trouble in school? Are you guys going through a divorce? You know, the typical things that would make a kid want to run away from home. They never asked if, if any of those things were present because then they would have been told that they weren't. But they didn't ask. And the police had a lot of theories, but most of them centered around Rachel running away, being willfully gone. They questioned her boyfriend, Manny. They demanded to know, you know, was Rachel pregnant? And now she's hiding somewhere in shame. Police had also read in one of her school books that uh, her back had been bothering her. And so they asked her parents, you know, maybe Rachel ran away because the demands of her dance education had become too much for her physically and mentally. The police did not actually or actively start even looking into Rachel's disappearance until Thursday, when they questioned Rachel's teachers and friends and boyfriend. And on Friday, the Richmond police arrived at the Barber home to search Rachel's bedroom. And they emerged from the room telling Rachel's parents that they had discovered what they thought to be a note written by a young girl who planned to run away. So basically on the back of a brochure for a modeling course that Rachel had completed the previous November, two sheets of paper were found stapled to the back of this brochure. And one said, running away. And the other said, station, go to Manny, 50 to $80, three special things. So they showed these notes to Rachel's parents and they were like, clearly here she is talking about running away. One note says running away. And the other is talking about like, you know, going to the station, meeting her boyfriend, you know, bringing money for the journey, bringing three special things to remind her of home. Like they had all they had the whole story written you know and elizabeth barber immediately dismissed these notes and these theories and she told the detectives that she knew at least the list the one that says three special things that had been written in november four months prior before rachel had vanished mike barber explained to the police that while rachel had been taking this two-week modeling course her boyfriend manny would deliver her there and wait for her to finish so he could accompany her home as well because Rachel was very scared of public transportation. The other things referred to in that note, 50 to $80, the three special things, that referred to Christmas. So the 50 to $80 apparently was the budget that the barbers had told Rachel they had to spend on her for Christmas that year. 50 to 
$1,000 was the max due to the cost of Rachel's full-time dancing fees and she had understood. So it was now her job to find things in that price range that she could ask her parents for for Christmas. The three special things was a plan for her boyfriend, Manny, for Christmas because Rachel had told her father that she wanted to get Manny three special things for Christmas. Now, neither Elizabeth or Mike could explain the running away note, but they were sure that Rachel had not been planning to run away when she had written those words. Now, as it turns out, Rachel had been referring to shoes. These were cross trainers called runaways, but no one really knew it at that point. However, within a week, the barbers had figured this out because they were also curious, like, was Rachel planning to run away? Why would she write this? So they did a lot of research into it. You know, they did a lot of research into it, not the police. The police were like, she wrote the word runaways. So (laughs) obviously that means she's going to run away. But even when they figured out, you know, why the shoes were called that, even when they had explanations for everything else that Rachel had written, the police shrugged these explanations off and told the barbers that all the evidence pointed to Rachel running off of her own free will. They said it was obvious that Rachel's parents did not know everything about Rachel's life and she had been keeping secrets for them. And they advised that the barbers should go home, seek counseling, and focus on their two other children. The Barbers were left to come up with and pursue other leads. And it was during this time of desperation that Elizabeth thought of someone who should certainly be looked into. Apparently, there was a male friend of Elizabeth's. They weren't co-workers, but they worked together because they had businesses that were sort of parallel. And he'd become a problem recently. At first, Elizabeth had thought that she and this man had a normal friendship. They would sometimes get coffee on their way home from work, and they would talk about their jobs and their lives. But he'd gotten progressively more and more attached and creepy as time went on. So this man actually took and gave Elizabeth pictures Um, from the cafe that they would drink coffee at. She said it was like pictures of empty chairs and empty tables and stuff. And she was like, this is weird. And he basically began to stalk Elizabeth. He would show up at places he knew that she liked to go to. He would sit in his car and wait for her to leave work. He would sometimes put his business card in her car or on her car when she wasn't around. And two weeks before Rachel went missing, Elizabeth was home alone when this man showed up at her house and rang the doorbell. And he began calling the house as he stood outside, peering into her windows, right? So after a while of this, the man left. But later that day, the phone rang again and Elizabeth picked it up. You know, enough time had passed where she thought maybe it wasn't him, but it was him. And she was like, hello. And he waited a long time before speaking. And then he just like repeated her name, Elizabeth, Elizabeth. Elizabeth, until she hung up. Now, later that evening, Elizabeth went to take a shower, and then she got out of the shower, and she heard voices coming from downstairs. So she went downstairs only to find this man standing in her house talking to her two youngest daughters. He had shown up, and the girls, not knowing that he was a creepy creep, had let him inside. So Elizabeth put her foot down once and for all, and she was like, you are creepy. This is out of hand. Like, this is out of pocket. You have to leave. And she said he looked all confused. He was like, where is this coming from? But he did leave. But now she began to wonder if her daughter going missing might be connected. Elizabeth's birthday was coming up. This guy was creepily attached to her. Maybe when she told him, get out of here, and she put her foot down, finally he got mad, and he was going to kidnap her daughter and, like, send her back to Elizabeth dead. You know, like something you'd see in a horror movie. It was a stretch, and it was definitely, you know, an out-there theory, but Elizabeth and Mike decided to bring this information to the police, as well as to inform them that they'd figured out why Rachel had written the word runaway, because it was the shoes, and they got there at 2 p.m., and it was like an empty station. They were informed by the woman who was behind the desk that all the cops had left for the day, and the woman said, quote, Like everyone else, they are entitled to time off. You have already had a lot of police hours this week, and you're not the only parents of missing persons, end quote. The balls. The balls. Can you believe it? Can you believe it? So it's 2 p.m. The cops all go home. The parents of a girl who's missing and who, you know, hasn't really been looked for are there with more new information that might be relevant to finding her. And the, the lady behind the desk is like, um, you've reached your quota of help from the police this week. So you only get like five hours a week of police time and you've definitely exhausted that. So like, what do you want from us right now? Can you come back on Monday when your time refreshes? Absolutely insane. Can you imagine? 
I would have, I would have snapped. So Rachel's mother, Elizabeth, she's like, yeah, we understand. Obviously, cops need time off, but like, should all of them leave at the same time? Does does that seem smart? You know, and she was like, we're not here saying that the cops shouldn't have time off. But what we are saying is we we have new information that may help find our daughter. But Elizabeth and her new information, that was all waved off. And at that point, something inside of her snapped. And I'm surprised it took this much because I would have already done snapped several times. Elizabeth said she ran out of the Richmond police station and she threw her purse at a parked police cruiser before screaming, they are going to let our little girl die over and over again. And apparently she made quite a scene and then the police came out and they brought her back in. And you think at this point they're going to be like, oh, wow, man, we've pushed you to your limit. This is clearly something we're doing wrong. Like we are not fulfilling our obligation to you if you feel that this is the way you have to act out. So what can we do to make it better? And and essentially, like, that sort of did happen. But one of the cops also told her, like, you know, you can't be throwing your purse at police cars because we'll have to arrest you if you do that again. Like, oh, no. The deadly police cruiser destroying weapon of a handbag. Like, come on. On, man, could you imagine? Could you imagine throwing the mother of a missing girl behind bars because she threw her purse at your car? Like, if that doesn't say I have something to compensate for, I don't know what does. And the days they continued to pass exactly like this. Every day the barbers searched high and low for Rachel and tried to get help from the police, and every night they fell into bed exhausted but unable to sleep. And March 7th, that was Elizabeth's 40th birthday, and she spent it looking for Rachel. But what she didn't know at the time is that the police had received a tip, not because of anything they had done, but because of one of the missing persons posters that the community had helped make and distribute and get out there into the public eye. Now, a girl saw one of these posters. This girl was the older sister of one of Rachel's friends from dance school. Her name was Allison, and she was known to have a photographic memory. When she found out that Rachel had not been seen since quarter to six on Monday, March 1st, she called the police and she told them that she'd seen Rachel after that time. Allison said that she'd been riding on the number six tram when it stopped at the intersection of Chapel and High Streets at around 6.40 p.m. And Rachel herself had climbed on this number six tram in the company of another older girl. Allison said, quote, For starters, I couldn't work out why Rachel would be with her, although they were very chatty and obviously knew one another. And I don't like saying this about people, but the girl was heavy set and not attractive at all. Very plain. She obviously wasn't a dance student. End quote. Allison said the two girls had gotten off at the corner of Williams Road and High Street, and they had stood in front of a car dealership located in the inner city suburb of Praran and chatted for a bit before walking away together. The police worked with Allison to create a sketch of the girl that Rachel had been seen with. And then all of a sudden, everyone was taking Rachel's disappearance more seriously. And when I say everyone, I mean the people who weren't taking it seriously before, which was basically just the cops. A press release was put out. The media was running the story on the front page. And Australia's Most Wanted contacted the police about featuring the case. But when the barbers were brought in to look at this police sketch of the girl that Allison had seen with Rachel, they asked them, you know, does this sketch look like anyone you know? Does this sketch look like anyone Rachel knows? There was only frustration. Elizabeth said that there was something about the eyes and the chin of the sketch that looked familiar, but she couldn't put her finger on who they reminded her of. Now, earlier in their search, the barbers had contacted the phone company to get a list of incoming and outgoing calls that had been made from or to their house in the days before Rachel disappeared. Now, they were able to get a copy of the outgoing calls, but the phone company claimed that due to privacy concerns, they could not release a list of incoming calls. Directly after this, the barbers had gone to the police to see if the police could get those calls, the incoming calls, but they were told that they could not, which doesn't make sense, right? Because we know the police can get those things, but okay. On March 11th, the police apparently found it was finally important enough to go through the legal channels and find out who had been calling the barber home before Rachel disappeared. All of the calls were identified and matched to known persons, but there were two lengthy calls that had happened on the evening of February 28th, the night before Rachel went missing. One had come in at 5.24 p.m. and lasted 15 minutes. 
The other had come in at 5.45 p.m. and lasted roughly 30 minutes. Elizabeth remembered that Rachel had answered both of these calls. She'd seen her talking and laughing on the phone, and she had assumed she was talking to her boyfriend, Manny. But it turns out that Rachel had not been on the phone with Manny at that time. The calls had come in from a 20-year-old woman named Caroline Reed Robertson. When the barbers were asked how they or Rachel knew this woman, Caroline, they were confused. They said they had not seen Caroline or her family since December of 1997 when they had moved from Mount Albert. Caroline and her family had been neighbors across the street, and their daughter Ashley Rose had been friends with Caroline's younger sister. Elizabeth had also become close to Caroline's mother, a woman named Gail, who had turned to Elizabeth as a shoulder to cry on after her divorce from her husband and Caroline's father, David Reed. Mike Barber told the police that he had seen Caroline recently when his daughter, Ashley Rose, had been invited to Caroline's sister's birthday party at the Dunlow Avenue swimming pool. He had gone to speak to Caroline's mother, Gail, and he had left Rachel in the car, and Caroline approached the car and was speaking to Rachel through the open window. Mike saw them talking, but he was too far away to hear what they were talking about, and he never asked Rachel because he thought it was, you know, pretty innocent and benign. The two girls had known each other from the past. They'd grown up across the street from each other. Not a big deal. But both Mike and Elizabeth Barber described Caroline as odd and withdrawn, and the house she lived in could not be described as a happy house or a positive environment. Caroline Reed Robertson was born in Melbourne on November 3, 1978. She was the eldest of three girls, and she came from a middle-class family that could be described as financially well-off, but not in a good place emotionally. Her parents, Gail and David, had divorced when she was 16 years old. She and her sisters had stayed at home with their mother, and their father had moved out. Caroline had not been very emotionally stable even before this, but the divorce seemed to break her, and she coped by locking herself in her room and writing in a diary that she had kept for much of her life, and she did this for basically a year. She also wrote dozens of letters to her father, David, complaining about how unhappy she was and how much she hated her mother, Gail. Caroline seemed to really hate herself as well. She called herself fat and ugly, and when she was 14, she'd drawn a self-portrait of herself and surrounded it with words like stupid, obese, worthless, weird, unwanted loser, deformed, boring, pathetic, selfish, jealous. Caroline was also known to be a compulsive note-taker, and she wrote everything down, including a plan to fix all that she thought was wrong about herself. She had a nine-week plan to become basically a whole new person. She was going to get plastic surgery on her nose, which she thought was too big. She also had a plan to clear up her skin. She gave herself the nickname Spotty Dotty due to her acne problems, and she had a plan to lose weight. It did not seem that things were going well for Caroline at home at all. She hated her mother with a passion. She wrote in her journal that her mother, Gail, had struggled with deep depression after Caroline had been born, and she felt that she had never been given the love and attention that Gail lavished on Caroline's younger sisters. In a letter to her father, David, Caroline said, quote, Why didn't she just have an abortion? Sometimes it makes me sick to my stomach that I was produced out of her, end quote. So things were bad at home, and the situation with Caroline's peers at school was not much better. She told her father that she was teased constantly because of her appearance and personality, and apparently she had dreams of becoming an actress and being famous, and her peers made fun of her for these aspirations. She said, quote, I was always laughed at when I shared my dream of being an actor. All my life I have been told by people that I would never be anyone or anything, end quote. Caroline wrote that she felt like a troubled, tortured soul who had been thrown into an alien environment full of angels. Everywhere she looked, everything was better. Everyone was more beautiful than she was. Everyone was smarter than she was and more talented than she was. Everyone had a better life than she did. And she saw herself as the bad seed, the unwanted one, the damaged one. And so she said she began to act this way because this is how everyone was going to view her and this is how everyone was going to treat her anyways, so she might as well be that. She once wrote to her father, quote, David, I used to think of you as my friend, my only friend. Then sometimes you used to hurt me so badly I wished I was dead. 
I needed and still need someone I can talk to because I don't fit in anywhere in this crazy world. Because I'm ugly, obese, pizza face, white worm, massive nose, and just plain weird. Now I've got no one to talk to because you've let me down by hurting me so badly inside. The explosion is just going to get bigger and bigger until there's nothing left inside of me, end quote. And I mean, I guess you could say that Caroline liked her father, David, more than her mother, Gail. But not really. She really didn't seem to like him either that much. She said he was authoritative, um, a, a fascist like dictator. You know, he, he had a temper. He could be abusive. She doesn't specifically say how he's abusive, but we will talk about that in the next part. Now, as far as anyone knew, Caroline and Rachel had not been friends. There was a five-year age difference, but Caroline had babysat for Rachel and her two sisters twice, and their mothers were friendly, so they would see each other often. Caroline's mother, Gail, would often come over to the barber house to have tea or wine with Elizabeth and worry about her eldest daughter, who could not seem to get things right. She just could not seem to get things right. She was doing well in school, and then she stopped doing well in school, and now she was isolated, and she didn't have any friends, and she was rude and mean and disrespectful to her parents, and she, you know, didn't want to hang out with her sisters, and she just seemed to be miserable, and there was nothing that Gail could do to change it or make it better. Caroline didn't seem to have a direction in life. She kept to herself, she didn't have friends, she didn't want friends, and she also seemed to behave in a very dominant way with her mother and sisters after her father David left. So Mike remembered that when Gal would visit the barber house, Caroline would constantly call on the phone to check up on her and make sure she was still there and you know, be like, is my mom still there? What are they doing? And things like that. Mike Barber said that Caroline was always polite and distant, but they knew that she was behaving badly at home. Her mother, Gail, had suggested that they go to therapy to work through some of the things that were causing Caroline this strife, but Caroline had refused. For the most part, Caroline had seemed to be a very unhappy young woman who lived a life of misery, and the Barbers could not help but ask themselves how she could possibly be involved in what had happened to their daughter, because according to the police, Rachel had been communicating with Caroline right before she vanished. But as far as they knew, Rachel and Caroline had never been close and they hadn't really kept in touch. But Manny had said that Rachel was meeting an old female friend for a job. And then Elizabeth remembered that back in 1997, Caroline had taken photographs of Rachel for a school project she was working on. And the year after, Rachel had told her mother that Caroline had called and said that she knew someone who might be able to get Rachel real paid modeling work. But as far as Elizabeth knew, Caroline had never followed up and nothing had come from it. But now she was wondering, was this job that Rachel had been going to that night, the job where she was going to get clothing perks and make a load of money, enough money to buy a pair of shoes she'd been wanting for weeks, was it a modeling job? Was it a job that Caroline had brought to Rachel? And if so, did that mean that Rachel was alive and just hiding out, maybe staying with Caroline? Because Caroline would never hurt Rachel. What would be her motive? You know, this is a, a girl, a young girl that had grown up with Rachel, essentially. So a glimmer of hope began to grow in Elizabeth and Mike Barber, who by this point had started to sort of realize and accept that their daughter might be dead. But now they knew she may have met up with Caroline the day she went missing. And they felt that there was a good chance, if this was true, Rachel could be alive and well. This theory, this hope, was bolstered by the fact that Caroline, who worked at a telecommunications company, also lived in a flat in Prairan, the same place where Rachel had been seen getting off the tram in the company of an older girl. And the police would find, when they went to Caroline's job to question her on March 10th, that Caroline had called in to work on Monday, March 1st, and for the rest of the week, she'd called in several times, which is highly out of character for her. Caroline was a woman who showed up to work on time every day and rarely took days off. So now it seemed like the pieces were starting to fall into place. But what the Barbers would come to find out is their precious 15-year-old daughter, Rachel, she was dead. She had been dead for basically the entire time they'd been searching for her, the entire time that they had gone through this cycle of feeling scared and then looking and feeling hopeful and feeling that she was still alive and then accepting she was maybe dead and then getting new hope renewed when they found out she may have been with her friend or at least a girl she knew, Caroline. All that time, Rachel had been dead. 
and the person responsible for it would be a surprise to everyone. And that is where we will pick up in the second and final part of this case. Thank you guys so much for being here. Don't forget to follow me on social media, Instagram especially. The links are in the description box. But I believe next week starting Monday, starting next Monday, I think, I'm going to start vlogging um, on Instagram just for the week, show you kind of what I'm doing. I've done stuff like that before. People have really enjoyed it. And people have asked me to do it again. So uh, for the entire week, I'm going to just vlog like kind of a day in my life kind of thing all week long on Instagram in my stories. So go check that out. Also, don't forget to follow me on Twitter. Don't forget to follow my podcast, Crime Weekly, that I co-host every week with retired police detective Derek Lavasser. You can find new episodes wherever you get your podcast platforms. Those go up every single Friday. And our episodes come out on YouTube the following Wednesday. So you get the video version the following Wednesday. Don't forget to share this video if you think it's worth sharing. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. Don't forget to like this if you liked it. YouTube has been really suppressing my channel lately. I don't know what's going on, but yeah, it's been pretty bad. It, my videos aren't showing up and recommended. It's just been this constant demonetization thing. So just share the video if you can, like it if you can, you know, do stuff that's going to push it into the algorithm. Definitely throw me a comment. Tell me what you think so far. Thank you so much for being here. Stay kind, stay beautiful, stay safe. I'll see you very soon. Straight down And that river runs deep The mountains get steep And the voice is getting too loud Oh, this feeling's out of baby It's looking like a cemetery They're going back from the grave Calling out my name Better say your hell Mary But you don't know How deep it goes Until it's getting you slowly And so you got To let it go I got blood